import, not insert, import. In this case, it actually did scale it down really tiny, so I'm just going to scale it up bigger. I imported in the wrong scale. But so now I've got this nice, this nice, uh, this nice mesh surface. It's got some uh, some normal issues, which is why I can kind of like see through that structure. But Inspire in this software, it's basically to inspire the designer. That was the goal. It's not. This is not supposed to be my final structure. This is just supposed to basically give me a, a floor plan or like a, like a, a map of what I then want a CAD model. So I could very quickly go back in here and model out some very thin walls. Like maybe it's maybe I just go in here and draw. Oh, that was not the right kind of line. Draw. Ah draw some very quick structures through here and I'm again doing this very fast. I can actually probably just take a section of this SEC section and go I'm gonna lose my mouse again. You hide that. So now I've got basically that cross section of, of a portion of the part that I wanted to make. And then I can go back in and maybe add. And so it's still nasty. I don't like all of those, those horrible edges. And then I can go and recad model it. So offset surface by 2.5 millimeters. That's fine. And again, I'm not being super accurate. Not accurate, but super uh, like b bothered by not matching this exactly because of the speed that I want here, or like because I'm standing in front of you guys talking. But if I really wanted to, I would sit here and very carefully measure out all of these things. So now that I've, I've got those structures, let me get rid of these curves, they're confusing me. And so now that I've got this kind of structure, I can go back in, maybe add an even thinner surface in here. And again, because I'm going to basically smash these things together, not even smash, like not smash, but Boolean union everything together in the end, I don't really care about following those exact curves perfectly. So long as they're intersecting, that's basically for the sake of speed all I care about. Offset surface by one millimeter. Let me mirror that along the middle of my object. That's fine. Mirror that along here. And so once I've got my structure down in here, and I think it had some cross bracing too, if I, if I bring it up, yeah, it's got some cross bracing. But I mean, very, very quickly, I can model it. Maybe just enough to get a test model out that I go and print out really quickly on an FDM machine or on a SLS machine or whatever it is and do a test fit at this point. I'm just going to go in here and see if it makes sure everything fits together still. And so now we've got my reinforced structure, basically inspired by this guy that the software generated. And of course, I apologize for that, that look there. But I've now got my CAD, CAD model that if I wanted to, I could then take into ZBrush and run that same, that same standard workflow on. Not standard workflow, but that same workflow where I could go in here and be like, you know, maybe these surfaces are too thin. Maybe I need to like continue to refine it or continue to like analyze these things so I could then bring this structure into solid thinking again and run it and you can like iteratively run these softwares over and over and over again and you can even write a little like Python script that'll like just take the the ex the the output of your solid thinking and insert it back in yes yeah so depending on the orientation of the part you can run other stress analysis 
yes, you can run, so I'm not a, a solid thinking expert, but you can run all kinds of different stress analysis and, and orientations, and they've got a big map on their website of all the different things they run. Motorcycles, that air, I think the, uh, that Airbus, when Airbus made a motorcycle a little while ago, that electric bike, they, uh, I, I'm not 100% sure if it was solid thinking, but that was basically what they did, was basically apply all of the different forces you could um, like imagine on a bike, and then run it through that software a couple of times. And we have sometimes, this will take, we was talking to someone from uh, Euphoria the other day, and they said they had basically wrote a recursive script that the, the FEA analysis portion of that script took up to, I think, seven days to run through to create one of their Airbus brackets. And so it was a lot of like iterations and iterations and iterations. And so this is, this is as an example of topology optimization. There's also different like design workflows where you could use uh, generative design. And so instead of optimizing the topology, maybe it, it basically gives you 50 possible different outcomes and it'll test all of them. And so it'll give me, like when I click on this guy, this version, this version, that version, that version, that, and it'll test all of the possible different versions and then give me the, say, depending on what my parameter is, the 10 best outcomes of the 10,000 iterations it tested, and then from those 10 iterations, like those 10 outputs I get, or maybe even just one output I, I have it, we'll then take it and then make another 10,000 iterations of that, of the best possible one, and we can keep running that for days and days, and eventually you come up with a topology that doesn't look anything like something you would have expected, but it is possible. It might be the best solution for whatever it is you're looking. Maybe it's the uh, the joint on a six-axis robotic arm, like in a big KUKA arm. Like maybe the best possible way to support those joints is not a solid tube of steel. Maybe it's like a very fine lattice. But even that lattice is not a consistent like equilateral triangle running across the entire outside of this lattice. Maybe it's only in particular, like if it's say a, uh, an automotive arm that only does the same motion all day long and it doesn't have to like compensate on possibly doing 10 other motions, it's just picking up one part and the forces are only ever being applied on one side of that arm. Maybe it just reinforces that arm and the rest becomes nothing. And so if you're designing a custom robot for that specific application, maybe that's all you need. You don't need to invest in like 20 pounds of steel to get this six axis arm to move around. Maybe it's just a tiny little like pipe where the main stresses are run, and then a lot of SLS printed plastic going around the outside that's just sort of for safety or for running cables or something along those lines. And so like now that we're back here, we could either Boolean everything together, I could take it back into ZBrush, let's just do that, just to see what it would look like. ZBrush again, I can do it as an STL. Also, the resolution of parts is very important on exporting. So when I was exporting this STL halfway through, it gave me an option to uh, the maximum edge length between triangles. And so a lot of times I'll get files from people who have exported from a CAD software, and their CAD software, it'll be a perfect circle. Their screw hole is a perfect circle, but when they export it, they exported it at the wrong resolution. And so all of a sudden, it's now a really faceted, tri like a, basically a triangulated circle that doesn't work very well or it's not what your intended goal would be. And so when we print it out and send it back to you guys, then someone will be like, oh, well, your machine screwed something up or it, like it's wrong with the, uh, like something in your slicing software caused these issues. And it was really, no, it's the original cat data that you sent to it. It might look well, but no one really checks the meshes or the STLs that often. A lot of times people will like, oh, I've got an aerospace, like some, some bracket for like Airbus and they'll s send it over to us and we'll get it and be like, this is a horrible file and they just never bothered to look at it, or they never bothered to like fine tune these settings well enough to actually achieve what they want. And so like for instance, if I bump, if I bump this down, if I export, it's like, let's just make it a, a sphere as an example. Export this as, let's call it five. And if I click preview, this is a pretty dense mesh. But if I make it one and click preview, it's now not a really dense mesh anymore. Like it's got a much more faceted surface. It's going to make that five. Oops. If I make this five and click preview, 
Now it's even worse, or 50 preview. I guess it doesn't even go that high. But a lot of times I'll get files that, it, like, this sphere will be made of, like, eight possible polygons. And so it doesn't even look like a sphere anymore. But they won't have realized that when they export the files. And so when they get the files back, they have people are very upset that it didn't, doesn't match. But so if I export this guy at, let's call it 45, and then we're going to export this at 0 0.001 millimeters, which is what I found works pretty well for maintaining the, uh, basically the resolution of your structure. And so if I import this guy onto, what did I call that? Oh, it's not an OBJ. It's an STL. For some reason, ZBrush doesn't like their user interface could use some work. STL, and they put their STL importer in a different location than everything else. So now we've got this structure back in ZBrush again. And then let me very quickly just retopologize the whole, or let me weld some surface, weld some vertices first. Retopologize the whole structure. And so right now you can see, this is a probably a better example to see what retopologizing does. We've got different meshes going on. They're not, like they don't, they just intersect randomly. That, that edge there is not actually the edge of a mesh. It's just the graphical representation of where two things mesh together. It would have a black line on it if it was the edge of a mesh. But so if I dynamesh everything together, it'll give me a pretty good uh, retopologi retopologization of this, soft, of this object. And then maybe I want to smooth it all again. Smooth it all down. Everything's got nice fillets, things that are hard to fillet. It just filleted it over really well, very easily, very quickly. Not, did not spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to fillet all of those objects, particularly this really crude section that I drew through there that I just took. I would norm, like that was pretty bad, but now it's, it's pretty smooth. We can even like polish it some more. Did that do anything? Polish, a little bit. And so let's decimate it once more, just so it's not a really heavy file. Decimate current. Now, and so if you notice here, it, on the curved, the curved surfaces and the curved geometries, it kept the density of the poly count much higher than it did over the large flats. And so I, I know in like Magix and other softwares, it doesn't, it kind of does a general purpose, just removes like every other polygon. And so in areas where you would like to keep some, some accuracy, it doesn't do that. And so that's why I like a lot of mesh mixers, also quite good at, at a decimation, because it'll basically keep the surfaces you want smooth, smooth, and keep the poly counts low enough that it is still usable. And so if I export this guy again, as 67, something, some, just some number. But I could then bring it back into solid thinking and do this whole cycle once more. Or print it out, maybe it fails, maybe I make some modifications that I just, from my experiences and from being an engineer, I go in here and be like, you know, actually, or even from 3D printing, like maybe that, that overhang up there is too far to like print without, to be unsupported. Maybe I should actually go and add in some cross bracing or some 45 degree structures in here to help it better uh, stand to uh, whatever it is I'm trying to do to it. But that's the, I'm not at any point really thinking about, like, is this machinable? Or can I, uh, is it even possible if I can do it? Like, there's, I'm basically just trying to design it, boolean split, just to meet the requirements of whatever it is that I'm trying to do. I'm not stopping to be like, ah, that's an undercut. I can't do undercuts because it's just too hard. Or it's really expensive to make a, uh, an in, a, uh, injection molding tool for something with such a complex structure. Like, I don't care. It, it's complexity is free in 3D printing, and so really I'm trying to solve a problem. I'm not trying to like solve a problem in the context of can I solve it with this type of tool. There are some limitations depending on the specific machine. I think uh, SLA and a lot of the uh, type of printers that require support structures, so like FDM, SLA, DMP, um, are a little bit more limiting. Like if you really want to design a good part for those, uh, 